All right, and we are live. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. We are incredibly lucky to have an amazing collection of productive, pragmatic, bipartisan policymakers here to talk about, frankly, one of the most important and one of the very, very hardest topics in the entirety of the energy conversation, in the entirety of the clean energy conversation, in the entirety of the climate conversation. And that, of course, is reforming our outdated permitting systems so that we can actually build the clean energy that we need at the pace that we need to build it. Um, my name is Rich Powell. I'm the CEO of ClearPath. Uh, we are very lucky to work with conservative policymakers to advance policies that accelerate deep decarbonization technologies that reduce and and uh, the reduce and remove global energy emissions based in Washington, D.C. And I first want to give an enormous thanks to our friends at the Conservative Climate Foundation for bringing us all together here today, and our friends at the Atlantic Council for hosting us in this fantastic pavilion here at COP28 in Dubai. And what a COP it is. Um, just some quick thoughts about the scale and urgency of the challenge before we get over to the folks that you actually want to hear from. Um, if we're serious, if we are serious about solving the climate challenge, if we are serious about building the kind of clean energy in the United States alone that we would need to, to support our decarbonizing ambitions, we're talking about building tens of thousands of new projects in the next 27 years. And we're, we're about the end of this year, so let's call that 26 years. We're talking about building 10 to 15 projects a day. And that's across new clean electricity generating facilities, that's new pipelines of all kinds, carrying natural gas, carrying hydrogen, carrying CO2, carrying other advanced clean fuels, that's new minerals processing facilities and mines, that's 10 to 15 projects a day, a day. And every single one of those projects starts with the permit to build many multiple permits to build. As many folks who have followed this issue closely in the US know, uh, just a few quick statistics. The average environmental impact statement in the United States takes four and a half years to process through the federal system. If the policy enacted over the last few years has its desired impact and greatly in increases the number of projects that attempt to go through that system, we may have orders of magnitude more projects attempting to go through that same system that today already takes five years. The one thing we know about that system is the more projects that try to go through it, the slower it moves as a system. Um, so clearly, we need to rethink this regime entirely. And so I'm very lucky that we have a number of policymakers here today who are taking that challenge seriously and have taken a number of steps already legislatively and are exploring new ones to move forward that policy regime and modernize that permitting process. So I am very, very happy to introduce uh, first, let's see, I'm going to go right down the line. I'm going to start with Representative Garrett Graves from the great state of Louisiana, who's a member of the uh, T&I committee in the U.S. House. Then we've got Representative Scott Peters uh, from the great state of California, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, then John Curtis, representative from the great state of Utah, also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And last but certainly not least, Representative Tim Wahlberg from the great state of Michigan, also a member of Energy and Commerce. So I'm going to start by going down the line, and I'd love for each of you, you know, give us your high-level thoughts on what's at stake here, uh, where we are today, and where you think we need to go next on the permitting challenge. Uh, Representative Graves, I'm going to turn it first to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, look, you can look at all sorts of statistics showing uh, the, the work that needs to be done moving forward. There are some studies that show that we're going to have to have a tripling of electricity generation and transmission. Think about that for just a minute. A tripling uh, with a process that, as Rich just mentioned, takes in excess of four years, has an average of 115 lawsuits a year, and generally takes about two years to settle a lawsuit, and over half of them are settled in the government's favor. Uh, this process is fundamentally broken. During the Jimmy Carter administration, uh, the environmental impact statements were uh, supposed to take one year, one year, and today they're taking four, and by the way, on a road project, it takes over seven. Uh, years today. So, so you, you simply don't have a process that's capable of delivering 
what is needed in, for, in order for us to achieve or to maximize efficiency emissions reduction strategies or even meeting the demand of energy that's projected moving forward. As we move forward, it's all about reliability, affordability, cleanliness of energy supply, exportability of technology and security supply chain. Those five things, we cannot stop talking about them, but um, major, major issue is uh, permitting. Last thing I'll say on this. Look, everybody's out there saying, I'm worried about the environment, I'm worried about the environment. I want to remind you, the majority of infrastructure projects that are carried out across America today do not have to follow a National Environmental Policy Act review because they are funded with private dollars, local or state funds that do not trigger a NEPA analysis, yet we don't have a destroyed environment because there's an inherent desire within the public for us to protect the environment today. Fantastic. Hi, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Rich, for your help. I'm the reason you have a bipartisan panel today. Um, I, uh, oh look, there's a couple, no, don't, we don't have to do that here. It's a, um, I, um, I completely agree with what Garrett just said, and uh, I'm a, I was a proud to support the infrastructure bill and the IRA, but Princeton tells us that if we don't, for instance, um, expand transmission greatly, we're going to lose 80% of the climate benefit of the IRA. Uh, so our work is not done, and now our job is, to, is speed. If you think about the environmental movement in the 1970s, what was that about? It was about stopping us from making mistakes. We were making a lot of mistakes, chewing up coastal wetlands, polluting, whatever. We, we said, okay, government, before you do that anymore, before you can make a decision, you, know, you have to know all the environmental impacts of what you're doing, um, and you have to consider the alternatives, and that seemed like a good idea at the time. still seems like a good idea. Um, I actually practiced environmental law, tried to do permitting, and, and went through a lot of this with clients who said, this is taking a long time. And by the way, I have to spend every month on my loan. I'm not getting any benefit from it. There's huge cost to this. Um, if you're going to tell me no, just tell me no now. And so I, I came up with the motto that no is the second best answer. But it's not just that. It's not, it's not just the inconvenience of, of doing this, but the results are terrible. And just on interstate, tra interregional transmission, for instance, um, Garrett was saying uh, how much we have to build out. I'd say it's about 200,000 miles we have to, of, of transmission lines we have to build. At the rate we're going now, the rate we're going now, 1,800 a year. 1,800 a year. Um, we say we want to compete with, with other countries. Um, we built, since 2014, we built, uh, in North America built uh, 13 gigawatts, 12 gigawatts of interregional uh, transmission lines. 12, and we built, we was about half of it was us. Actually, it was seven, about half was, uh, was us. So say the United States was four, okay? Just for frame of reference. The comparable number in South America is 22. The comparable number in Europe is 44. And in China, 260. Um, we can't compete, we can't win, we can't solve the climate co uh, co uh, crisis without getting out of our own way. We have to be, make radical changes to this permit system uh, and uh, environmentalists should be leading the way, and so far that's not the case, but we're gonna, we're gonna get some bipartisan action in, in Congress, I believe. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. I, I'm gonna pick up where he left off. For, so he's the lone Democrat on this panel, but can we just have this moment? We're at Cobb, and we have three Republicans and one Democrat on the panel. <laughs> Usually, I'm used to being the lone Republican, and this is my third trip to COP, so it's really great to be with you. And what an important topic. So just a couple of things on permitting reform. There are a few things in Washington that is, are as bipartisan as permitting reform. There are a few things in Washington where we're as far apart as we are on permitting reform to getting an answer. It just seems to be elusive. Although everybody wants to do it, it just seems to be elusive. And let me just make a point here. So in my district in, in Utah, I have about 80% of my geography, 90% of it is owned by the federal government. If you think it's difficult to permit on, on non-federal government, imagine permitting on federal government property. We have a case where it took nine years to permit broadband going in an existing right of way on public property. So I'm just telling you, this, the orders of magnitude of this is huge. And going back to the IRA, uh, to Scott's point, when they did the IRA, the Congressional Budget Office didn't, didn't charge the IRA with all the dollars that were spent because they said those dollars cannot be spent because of permitting reform. 
that just shows you the, the difficulty of the task. So delighted to be here. This is a really important conversation, and I'll pass to my gentleman on the left. Delighted to be here as well. And again, this is the largest, largest bipartisan uh, congressional co-del that we've ever had. Uh, it's amazing. Um, Scott can say he's the token Democrat here on our panel. I'm the token Northerner with a number one football team in the land. <laughs> Go blue. Hey, that's environmental. And that takes permitting. We don't even have a coach on the field most of the time. So, hey, I, um, I, I'm privileged to represent a district that goes from Lake Michigan on my west to Lake Erie. Two of the five great lakes in my district. No salt, no biting fish in any of those lakes. On both of those extremes in my district, on Lake Erie, I have Fermi nuclear plant. On the west side, I have Cook nuclear plant, both generating significant power, both needing updatings. But because of permitting challenges, I know Fermi has already said they probably never will have that opportunity because it will be too costly to do. That has to change. Just north of my Cook plant on Lake Michigan as well is the Palisades nuclear plant. It's been decommissioned. Fortunately, a company bought it. They want to put it back into operation with advanced nuclear reactors. They're in the process of doing that. We need that power now. As our state government has decided, we are going to get out of fossil fuels. We want to go to all renewables by 2030. It's not going to happen. But in the meantime, we need stable power. One thing with permitting that I look at not the, not the minds of these three preceding me on this issue yet. But it has to be predictable, it has to be realistic, and it has to be affordable. And the permitting process at this point in time isn't. As we see what's taking place, whether it's with my nuclear plants or Line 5, bringing across propane and natural gas from Canada to the United States and back to Canada, stopping over in the United States in a good partnership agreement just getting the permit to put a new Line 5 in that will protect the Great Lakes forever, putting in a tunnel itself underneath the base of, 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 the, uh, of, of the lake is, is, has been up until this time almost impossible. Those are the challenges we face. We have the, the know-how to do what we need. We just need the permitting process that, again, is affordable, it's realistic, and most importantly, uh, it's predictable. So important, and especially your point on the interlinkage between the permitting system and the cost. You know, on average, every year of delay is another 20% cost, right? So round numbers, that's five years, double the cost, right? Of it a becomes project. real money, even yeah. in government terms. Yeah. Um, and thank you as well for invoking nuclear. The entirety of the last panel was on nuclear, so I'm not going to let us go deep down that, that. But I do think it's worth celebrating that this is very much the nuclear cop. It's been an enormous amount of uh, progress and announcement here uh, on, uh, on nuclear energy and, uh, and global prospects for nuclear as well. Um, Con Congressman Graves, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so can you walk us About through... About Congressman Wahlberg's football comment? What's that? We, we can also litigate that. So uh, this year, working with Speaker McCarthy and bipartisan um, uh, uh, work in the House... Uh, you passed the debt ceiling deal, which included permitting reform measures, which were part of your HR 1 bill. Can you tell us a little bit about HR 1 and how it addressed permitting reform? Tell us what went into the permitting deal and tell us what's happened since then um, as, that, as that implementation has begun. Sure. Um, so, so first of all, we started working with a very diverse group of interest. And I want to be clear, these are people that are in the regulated community, people that have had to go through NEPA and other things in, in the past and, and kind of took all the lessons learned. And we put together a bill called the Builder Act. Builder Act was included in HR 1. It was our big energy package that passed the House of Representatives later this year. In May, we started negotiating debt ceiling with the White House. As part of those negotiations, we introduced NEPA reform to those negotiations. And we made significant headway. I'm going to estimate that perhaps 60% of the Builder Act was included and, and became law 
um, in the Fiscal Responsibility Act or debt ceiling. That included things like raising the threshold for when NEPA applies. Uh, current standards is the first penny of federal funds. You can have a, a trillion dollar project. It has one penny of federal funds. All of a sudden, NEPA applies, federal standards apply. Uh, so we raised that threshold. Number two, we limited the scope of the NEPA review to reasonably foreseeable impacts instead of just uh, saying anything that could possibly happen under any scenario. Number three, we limited our environmental assessment one year, 75 pages, an environmental impact statement, not four years, as Rich just said, not seven years as in a transportation project, two years and, uh, uh, and, and 150 pages. Um, we expanded the use of categorical exclusions across agencies. <clears throat> Whenever you have a project that's of a known type and impacts, you can get a categorical exclusion or expand the use of it from a sister agency. We codified in federal law one federal decision you can imagine <clears throat> trying to operate by committee. You have Corps of Engineers, EPA, National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, all these different resource agencies that are at the table, and everyone's in charge. You can't make a decision. You have somebody, you have U.S. Fish who's arguing about what happens with freshwater fish. You have National Marine Fisheries Service arguing about what happens in saltwater. Neither one of them come in an agreement. You've got to have a decision maker. So we codified that. All sorts of reforms or changes, these are in law today. And uh, really excited about that. However, um, in the draft rules that the White House has put together, they completely trashed, and I want to be clear, completely trashed the agreement that we had made in those negotiations. Um, went in and basically, I'm going to say, ignored uh, the deadlines we put in place. And they, they, they changed the time for when the clock starts ticking to hit the one year or the two years. Um, they introduced some uh, climate and, and environmental justice provisions that create very, very vague conditions under which you could see um, uh, rejection, you could see scoping go well beyond what was intended. Uh, a number of things that they've done in their draft rules that were wholly inconsistent with the four corners of the agreement that we made that was a very, very in-depth negotiation that went on for an extended period of time. There was complete clarity in our, in our discussions in terms of what the agreement is. So we are trying to push back a White House right now to get them back within the four corners of the agreement that we actually had in the, um, in the Fiscal Responsibility Act negotiations. Would anyone else like to weigh in, please? So I want to say, I, and I really feel Garrett's pain um, as an environmentalist, uh, we are losing sight of the big picture, which is that 90% of the projects in the queue are non-polluting, non 90%. So if you're in any business or you're, you're dealing with um, any transaction or even with your children, you're going to give up 10 to get 90, right? And we Democrats are getting on our own way. What, de what, what Garrett did was remarkable in the context of legislating but minuscule in the context of the climate challenge. I mean, we're still talking about processing 60,000 projects. We, you know, and, and, the, and remember, 90% of them clean, we're entirely in the way of that progress. And so um, I, I, uh, I, I think that we have to go a lot further than what we've done already. And it should be the climate, uh, climate action advocates should be leading this, not getting in the way of that. Unfortunately, um, we're asked backwards right now. It's just not that way. Uh, and I'm just trying to say, let's look at the facts. If you really want to decarbonize that much in, in 30 years, you, we have to go on offense. We have to get out of our own way. And, and I think what Garrett did, um, the, the way people squawked about it uh, from, from the left was remarkable. And we really need to talk back against that. If you, if you care about this planet, you've got to get the process out of the way. We have the money. That, that's what we used to worry about, right? We have the money. We've got to get it out of the bank. More thoughts on this one? Hmm? Um, well, I want to follow up maybe on something you just mentioned. Um, so this idea of, you know, if we, if we grapple with this, 60,000 projects, right? How could we possibly move that through the queue? We do have this other tool, and you mentioned it. So technically, in the U.S. context, it's called categorical exclusions, or we could rename that tool. But the basic idea is, you know, as members of Congress, you can say what these statutes apply to and what they don't apply to. And so um, in the past couple of decades, we've, we've applied this, I think, quite successfully twice for permanently for oil and gas leasing on federal lands in 2005 in a period of energy crisis and temporarily for solar on public lands in 2009 to help spur the industrial solar industry. Both of those have worked reasonably well. 
right? And we don't have all those projects going into the queue. And so, you know, whatever you want to call this, categorical exclusions, it's pre-clearance, right? It's legislative clearance of projects. Do we think this could be in the cards? I mean, we know it works. Obviously, it's hard. It requires Congress to take a lot of heat because you've got to make the decisions. Not, it's not delegated to the administration. You've got to make the decisions. Do you think it's possible? Can we do more of these? Is that in the cards? Anyone? Anyone? Like this one? I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the warm-up for Garrett here on this question. Listen, when I went to Congress, one of my biggest aha moments was it's hard to pass legislation, even really good legislation. And, and we literally see uh, bills that will have hundreds of co-sponsors not even come up for a vote. And I think it just shows you the difficulty of the task. And then you layer on top of that just the complexities of what's happening right now in the House uh, with leadership and, and even, even just trying to get a budget done. And so I don't want to be gloom and doom on it, but it does, it does mean to me, like we have to be laser focused. We have to be very bipartisan and we've got to get leadership right on, on board what we're doing. And that's, here again, going back to what Garrett did, that's why it was so remarkable what, what he did. But it, we're in an environment where even good legislation doesn't even come up for a vote. Let me be a little bit more optimistic if I could. Um, so the Aspen Institute did this really great study that was led by um, Jim Connaughton, who was CEQ under W, and Katie McGinty, who was CEQ under Clinton. And they sort of looked at this issue and, and what could they do? And they came up with four really good ideas. One was, one and two were to give preference basically to places that were already disturbed. If you, if you were working on a brownfield, for instance, why not accelerate the approval there, do pre-clearance for things there? If it's a technology you understand, for God's sakes, are we really gonna argue about the, the environmental disadvantages of a solar utility project? Maybe that's something you would accelerate because it seems like the legislator, legislature and the president have decided that that's a policy we want to pursue. Third, figure out some way to get state and, local, uh, state and locals on board. Um, a lot of this drag isn't just at the federal level, although we could set a good example by doing permit reform. It has, still has to happen at the state level. And fourth, you've got to go after NEPA litigation. Even if you left NEPA as it is, it's not just the, it's, it's not just the, um, the preparation of the documents. But it's afterward, this is what I used to do, it's afterward it takes years to litigate NEPA. And often what it goes back and they, they, they send it back to have a, re, a review redone and it comes back to the court. There's ways to make that a lot faster. Why shouldn't that be 120 days uh, process instead of, uh, instead of years? And that's, that, those are all really good ideas I think we should pursue. Um, and I think everyone's got to climb the fence and jump off together. But I just want to give you a quote from that study. They're, they're, um, their conclusion was that achieving net zero emissions by 2050 is ecologically essential, technologically feasible, economically achievable, but procedurally impossible. And that's where we are. Let me, let me just jump in here uh, with something. Uh, I, I, I've just heard recently there's potentially a new, new technology coming out called AI or something. Can you say more about that? I'd have to kill you if I told you. No, I'm, I'm thinking about this. We have, we have good work that's been done. We've got plenty of precedent. I think we need to think outside of the box. If indeed Congress is cumbersome, if indeed the bureaucracy is even more cumbersome, sometimes if it's, if it's the, the private sector, citizenry, etc., that can be cumbersome in, in accepting something not in my backyard, as it were, with permitting, we have a tool that's coming out with AI. We're dealing with that in Energy and Commerce Committee. But this is something looking at the future of saying, how do we rush these, these permits? Because I think it has to be a rush. It has to be predictable. It has to be realistic. It has to be affordable. We've got bases of, of knowledge and information. We've got past history of what's necessary to look at. And I think tools like AI and others could be very helpful in moving forward. And maybe at COP, we ought to be talking about some of those things, too. Yeah, I just want to point out, too, that uh, not in all cases, but in some cases, when we say no, we're forcing that overseas to conditions that we don't control at all. And um, we've all seen, you know, the, the pictures and things like that of human rights violations and, and imagine the emissions. There's no emissions controls, no OSHA controls. So when we say no at home in pursuit of perfection, a lot of times we're just pushing that someplace else that we have zero control. 
And I'll just double click on that point. Even domestically, we say, well, we have an environmental justice problem. You know, it's, it's, it's often those communities that don't have the resources to sort of, you know, use all these procedural processes. And so that's, that's why we have an environmental justice problem. Do you want to come back to the adjudication point? Yeah, yeah I'd love to. So uh, Congressman Peters brought up this, this litigation issue. And under current law, you can wait six years six years after your report's issued, your, your environmental documents are done, and you can file lawsuits. There's nothing that requires people to actually participate within the NEPA framework. And so under the Builder Act, what we did is we actually said that the only way you have standing to file litigation is if you first try and participate in the public participation process. And if, you, if your goal is truly to resolve your issue, try and resolve it within NEPA. There, there is much public participation framework there. So, so after you engage in the public participation under the bill we wrote, um, if you're unable to resolve it there, you then have 120 days after documents are filed in order to file your, your litigation. Not six years, but 120 days. And once again, the only way you have standing is if you first try and work out through the public participation process. I think that's a really good model. In our negotiations with the White House, I will tell you we came very close to uh, getting to a uh, compromise on judicial review, not as, as aggressive as what I just noted, but we, we came really close. We ultimately just ran out of time. But as Congressman Peters has said, I think this is a key point of the next phase of, um, of reform that we're going to be working on. And it's not just me saying it. It's not just John Kerry saying it. Uh, excuse me, uh, Scott Peters saying it. We just left the meeting with John Kerry, where John Kerry uh, even said it. I know, I know. <laughs> Indistinguishable, Scott. Um, uh, but, but John Kerry said it uh, in, in a meeting we had with him just a little while ago. So this is a, uh, a very widely held belief or it's something we all acknowledge is a major problem within NEPA. Um, of course, many other things, but that one certainly is fundamental. Rich, can I just please use this opportunity to point out the problem of, of capital? Imagine going to investors and saying, look, I've got a really good project and it's, it's going to pencil. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, historically, every project like this is sued for 10 years. So, so you now have to add 10 years. You can see why capital is going to run from this. Uh, which is a huge problem. And you see, there's, there, there are lots of reasons that it's been a challenging year to build wind in the U.S. There was an announcement just this morning that in the whole third quarter of this year, we added 288 megawatts, so that's about one wind farm, in the whole third quarter of this year. And that, that's not entirely due to this permitting process. Lots of capital is expensive, things are hard right now, but the permitting process has just been really, really savage, especially to these offshore wind projects. Some of them have gone through, you know, to your point, four different NEPA suits for the Vineyard Wind Project alone. It's been, you know, it's, it's really kills the economics of a lot of these projects. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of violent agreement on, on this stage, a lot of violent agreement on the stage, which is a good thing um, that we need to do something about this. Can we all talk a level higher about, you know, what, what, what the contours of a deal on this might be from y'all's perspective? and how we actually get there. Um, uh, Congressman Peters, I'd love your perspective on, on how many fellow Democrats you think might come along for a deal like this. Well, this uh, is... and, and for everyone, I'd love your perspectives on, on how many more folks you think could come to this and, and how you think we actually get there. I'm happy to answer this. this actually, it's, it's sort of Garrett's turn to answer this question, but I will, I will um, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I think... There is um, a real concern among Democrats about transmission, expanding transmission. It's seen as it is foundational to, to building out a, a clean energy transition. I think um, we have not done a lot of work, enough work to, un to make um, folks from places like Louisiana understand why it's important in general for liability. The amount of load we're going to have. It growth is going to require us to build a better grid. We want to build a better grid, a more secure grid. We need to get everyone on board on that and get some real uh, relief around siting. Make sure you can cite lines about cost allocation, uh, which is sort of generally understood, but probably needs some more specifics. Um, John Hickenlooper I have, and I have the Big Wires Act, which is a minimum transfer requirement, which would provide some duty of each region to be able to, to move electricity. Um, I think there, there are some uh, issues around oil and gas that need to be resolved. I think that those kind of have to go with transmission. And I'd let Garrett talk about more, more what, what he's interested in that. Um, 
And then I think we're all interested in permit reform. I, I think no one is interested in this long litigation for any project. Uh, I think that should, uh, that, that's a really a matter of, of convincing some of the environmental groups that NEPA was not written by Moses, you know, on tablets. I mean, really, the reaction you get to, to this is really, it's like, uh, how dare you even touch NEPA, even though really the goal is to protect the environment. And all of a sudden, this is in the way of us playing offense on that ground. Um, and then I do think we have to deal something, do something about the volume of projects that we have. We have to come up with some preclearance mechanism that doesn't require us to be looking at each one of these individually, uh, particularly when they're each well understood. So I think that's kind of where, where it's going to go. Um, I, I really I do want to say that in particular, um, these two gentlemen to my left, right and left have been really um, important in this, along with Bruce Westerman. Um, and I want to congratulate John because he did create the Conservative Climate Caucus in Congress. When I came in, I think we often rightly accused Republicans of being deniers. I mean, John has 80 some, a third of all House Republicans who've declared that climate change is happening. It's driven by human activity. Um, that's a huge, a huge place to, to, a huge movement for that group. And I think John deserves a lot of credit for putting that together. Now I'm like tapping my foot. There you go. No. Now I'm tapping my foot and saying, okay, John, what are we gonna do with all those people? Let's pass some laws. Um, uh, can, I, uh, can I ask you about the gas portion of this deal, right? So, oh, sorry, actually, yeah, start, we want to start there? Yeah, yeah, look, I, I think that what Congressman Peters brought up in terms of contours makes a lot of sense. So I'll, I'll run through kind of my list. One, I think judicial review is, is critical. Um, and any time I'm saying something and John Kerry saying it, you know, that seems like maybe there's a deal in there. Um, I, um, I, I agree with him that I think that uh, transmission is, is something that, that we need to be uh, working on. I think EV charging stations is another one that we need to be talking about. Um, I, uh, I think 401 certification on pipelines is something that uh, we need to look at and help to clarify what the, 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 the law truly uh, intended. I think that um, if we're going to be realistic and truly apply math and science to the equation, then as, as uh, Congressman Peter said, we do need to be looking at oil and gas because and, and I want to be really clear on this, because the Biden administration's EIA, EIA says that we're going to have a 42% increase in oil demand globally. The, the Biden administration's um, EIA says we're going to have a, uh, what is it, a 50, what is it, a, was it 57 percent increase, yes, globally in natural gas. And, and so if that's the case, and if these are Biden administration figures, we need to make sure we're getting them from the place that have the lowest carbon intensity. Where is that? It would happen to be the Gulf of Mexico. And so making sure that we're being thoughtful about strategies moving forward. Looking at things like, um, uh, I think as part of this discussion, what is your critical mineral load? What do you need for refining and, and, and processing of those? Uh, where is that going to come from? We have resources in the United States. What is the strategy there? Uh, that needs to be part of this discussion. Again, this is math and science. And one other thing I'll add that you didn't bring up, and I'm curious about your thoughts on it, is looking at a surrogate process or perhaps a delegation scenario. I said earlier, the majority of projects carried out across America today do not go through NEPA, do not go through a federal review. So is there something we can do to allow for a surrogate process by state or local governments that can suffice or cover the base for NEPA um, in a way to kind of expand capacity? Because we, uh, both, both Rich and Congressman Peters have talked about this surge of projects. So can we use other outlets to help to, to address those? So that's kind of my, my list. Uh, Just because we're, we're about to finish off our deal on permanent reform here, um, right, right in this audience. I'll just I add hope that everyone is taking notes. On the state and local side, there's sort of two approaches. One is the more draconian, which says unless you have permitting laws that are at least as fast as ours, you, um, your permitting laws don't apply. We just actually preempt it. The other is to do what you do with highways and say unless you do this, this, and this, we're not giving you federal money. At least we could do that, I think, but um, we haven't taken that. I have not tried to take that on yet. That seems to be really – the local control issue, you tell me if I'm wrong, seems to be a, um, a little bit of a harder – sell among Republicans right now. I, I, oh, by the way, Florida would be a lot better at changing its laws in California to make things go faster. But I, so I'd be happy to kick California in the pants that way. 
I, I think that, just to answer your question real quick, I think that the local control issue, it's something that's doable, but again, just like our problem with 401 certification, you got to put the right parameters in place. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to speak up as a former mayor uh, here and talk about local control. There is some concern uh, with local control that, that you don't want to take away from a city um, their, their right to dictate how their city grows and, and, and where they zone certain projects and where they don't zone certain projects. So I get a little nervous if the federal government's going to come in and say, you don't, you, you can't, you can't not allow a project um, in, a, in a place in the city where you don't want that project. At the same time, I get it, cities and counties and states need to understand this has to go someplace. So there's, there's got to be a balance between uh, local control and needs that have to happen. And I, I'll just observe that in some instances, we've been talking about general permitting here, there are some instances, so CO2 sites, for example, we're going put to put it CO2 underground, where, where states appear to be better situated in many ways than the EPA to issue those permits. So we have a process where a state can take primacy of that. And I think in some cases where the states are better situated, it, it, appears, it, it appears that it could, um, it could work faster, it appears. Um, uh, can, we come, can we come back to the, uh, to, to the gas part of this? And so to your point about the US role in global decarbonization and all this, obviously uh, we've got parts of the country where we have abundant gas, very low, very low cost gas, and it's effectively boxed in by you know, sort of complete, you know, complete opposition to, to pipelines and complete blockage of pipelines. Do you think there, you know, you, so you mentioned the 401 fix, are there other, other pieces there that would sort of enable more LNG exports or, you know, more use of gas as part of this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Or, or more use of carbon capture as well? Yeah, it's a, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Let me, let me just go back very quickly on the whole local state and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, um, all right, so do a little remedial here. So first of all, just on the local state, all that stuff, look, one, if you're talking about a project that goes across, all across the state and goes into three different states and all that, no, obviously you can't put a local or state government in charge of it because it's going to cross over multiple states. So that, you, you got to have the right parameters in place. Secondly, 401 fix, Scott's asked me to clarify that. Under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, states have the ability to effectively comment on water quality certification. What's happened is that in recent years, states have weaponized this as a way to prick pick project winners and losers. They've come in on projects that they don't want to happen, like, for example, an interstate gas pipeline, and said, oh, no, no, this isn't consistent with our water quality. Well, they're using it as a weapon, and it was not what Congress intended. And so our fix would basically, which, by the way, we've done this out of committee and through the House a few times, just hadn't become law yet, but it would, it would basically limit a state's um, uh, sort of authority in this case to truly adversing affecting water quality and not using it as a as a weapon to, to pick project winners and losers. Um, what's the last thing? I'm supposed to, oh, so gas, so stranded gas projects. So in, in look, this stuff is absolutely critical. We sit here and we talk about emissions reduction. Let me give you a number. I'm I'm, I'm always floored by this figure. You're all familiar with Russia and invading Ukraine. Um, if we had simply taken one year, one year, of Russian gas that was being supplied to the European Union and supplanted it with U.S. gas, it would have reduced emissions 218 million tons in a single year. Think about that for just a minute. All these strategies we're doing and we're trying to reduce emissions by tens of thousands of tons or hundreds of thousands of tons, this one action would reduce emissions 218 million tons every year. It would have kneecapped Vladimir Putin from a, a monetary perspective. It would have taken that leverage away that he had over the European Union. I mean, just win, 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 win. And, and so we, we cannot, you know, and here at this COP, they're talking about phasing out fossil fuels and all this kind of stuff. Look, that's fine as long as we're doing it in a way that is actually based upon the math and science and makes sense. But I think it's a mistake for us to be simply targeting energy sources and not staying focused on the emissions. It's a, it's a flawed strategy. So what needs to happen in regard to these stranded assets? If we have the, the lowest intensity gas in the world or some of the lowest intensity, carbon intensity gas in the world, we should not be limiting or stranding these assets. We, it is better for the global environment to ask, for us to actually connect this to the grid 
and, and, and actually for us to be able to export it, which means we need to be permitting more LNG export capacity, and it means that we need to be allowing for pipelines to be built to transport this clean source uh, out of the, or, excuse me, around the United States and potentially to export sources as well. And of course, we need to continue working on projects like carbon capture storage and, and others to help to complement that in terms of the emissions footprint. Very responsive. Very responsive. All right. Uh, I think we're starting to run short on time. Mr. Wahlberg, I want to come back to one thing you mentioned earlier. So we talked a little bit, we're talking technology specific now. Coming back to nuclear on the technology specific side, um, clearly uh, per permitting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, permitting in and around nuclear has been a challenge. Uh, I know on the, on the committee, you all have taken action, I think just in the last week, on a number yeah. of pieces of legislation, some of which included some NRC modernization and reform proposals. I wonder if you could just give us your thoughts on, you know, how do we get the permitting, uh, the technology specific permitting uh, piece of the piece of the puzzle right for nuclear energy? Well, I think we I think we took took a good whack at it last week, with the bills we brought out of committee, 44 bills in that markup, and some of them c contained the nuclear uh, regulatory reform. And then you got on a plane and came here, so it's been a busy got on a plane it's been a busy here. week. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, th I think what we're looking at is, is a, a history of, of safety and security within our nuclear industry. We've got ships, submarines going all over that have been safe. We've got, uh, we've got a history here in the United States of safe actors with our, our nuclear power plants, including, as I said, the two in Michigan right now that are still operating. We need to find a way by which we can look at what's needed, what has been learned already, how we can run permitting processes parallel without pl plopping them on top of each other one after another, but run them, run them alongside to give hope, to give that predictability, uh, that investment opportunity that continues to go in uh, to, to make this, which uh, doesn't cause any real problems that we have, is the closest thing to renewable resource and, and provides the baseload power that we need. You know, in Michigan, uh, solar, wind have their place, uh, but we don't have that much sun. Uh, and so to have something that is certain as, as nuclear power to make sure that the regulatory uh, regime that's in place allows us to not only keep but update but then expand would be the way to go. Um, I wonder if I can ask all of you one last question, and I'd love all, uh, all of your thoughts on this. How do you actually see, I mean, we've heard a lot about the, the policy pillars that could be part of a grand bargain around this, you know, big deal around this. Obviously, it would need to cover a lot of things, um, you know, what, what these laws apply to, how they're decided and adjudicated, what we do on transmission, what we do on pipelines, what we do on mines, what we do on these technology specific things. So a lot in this package. How do we actually get there? What, what do you see as the prospects for moving forward further on this the remainder of this Congress? Is this a, you know, we, we, do, we do much more of this Congress, but then this really sets things up for a deal in the next Congress. It sounds like we have support from this administration, you know, maybe to move something next year. How do you see this moving forward? Handicap for us, whether we're going to have a great big ambitious permitting reform deal in the next 12 and a half months or next Congress. Uh, yeah, sure. So one, uh, look, this is absolutely doable. It is, and I want to thank Congressman Peters for being really thoughtful and beginning to put um, some ideas together on what this looks like. Um, I think what, what needs to happen is that we need to have a bipartisan group that is meeting on a regular basis to talk through this, to talk through what is actually doable from our perspectives. Uh, I think we're going to have to spend part of our time educating people because I do feel like this is one of those issues that is somewhat Greek, and as Congressman Peters has said, uh, NEPA is viewed as one of those, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll use a nuclear term, sort of, um, it's just kind of radioactive almost where you, you know, you, you, you don't touch this. You, you, you know, it's one of those sacrosanct things. You don't ever touch it. I want to remind you. Not we, that radioactivity is bad. It's uh, good and useful. I, I know. It's good I know. and useful. But, um, but, but, you know, we did 25 pages of law changes to NEPA just six months ago. So um, this, this, you know, veil has already been pierced. We're already making changes to it. Um, but we've got to educate people and, and stay focused on better environmental outcomes. And I think that we can all sit down and work that out. So I think a bipartisan working group is the best way to move forward on this and just make sure we're being really thoughtful about a balanced approach. I think, yeah, good, I like that. 
And we'll see if everybody can get an applause. Based entirely, on, we'll based entirely upon the list that I put That's together. It. Yeah. Um, I think two things. One is I think what, De what Garrett said before about um, concentrating on what the emissions are, like. That that's what we're after. We're after emissions reduction, right? So no sacred cows under that. I mean, if, I, if that means that natural gas can fill part of that, I've got to be willing to do that. If that means that NEPA has to be changed because of the timelines, we have to be willing to do that. Um, and I know that I, I, they, the Republicans claim to be all of the above. I know that they're going to facilitate that as well. But it's about getting to the emissions level. That's, what's gotta, that's where the truth is going to come out. That's where the facts are going to come out. And the other thing is it has to be bipartisan. Um, this sort of goes without saying. You need, you need 60 votes in the Senate to do anything. You need 218 in the House. You need a presidential signature. Um, and so, um, you, you know, I just think that the notion that uh, Democrats can do it by themselves um, is, is easy thinking, but, but, but not good work. And uh, I'm certainly committed to doing that. And if you'll invite me to be on your secret panel, I'll be on it. <laughs> Thanks, to everyone, for having me, by the way. I, I wonder where the secret panel could begin meeting. You know, I wonder. So not long ago, there was a, a, a book that was very famous that said, um, good is the enemy of great. And I actually think great is also the enemy of good. And sometimes we, we, we try to legislate to perfection. And uh, I think at some point, as, as members of Congress, we need to realize, look, this bar is, is, is good. And instead of walking away from all of it, we, we, we've got to do that. So my, my warning to all of us up here is this concept of, look, let's get a good permitting uh, bill and not give up because it's not perfect. And I jump on everything these guys have said already, as you might expect, being clean up here. But I think this morning in a bilateral meeting that we had with one of, the, one of the, our, our partner countries, when asked the question about their use of the fossil fuels, which was significant because of their country uh, and the setting they had, said, what is your number one concern? Emissions. Just came out straight, just like we've said here. We need to make sure our countries, and in our case, the United States understands that we have a common goal, Democrat, Republican, reducing emissions for the good of our country, for the good of our future, but then do it in such a way because of investments that are needed. We need that um, reliability, that affordability, and that predictability. If we can get that message out to our constituents, and I think from the ground up, pretty soon the local mayors, the states, and our federal offices can work together if we have the common goal of emissions reduction and doing it in a way that makes sense. I think we can do it. Inspiring words. Thank you all so much for all of these ideas and insights and optimism. And I'm excited to hear prospects are possible for this uh, very soon. I again want to thank uh, the uh, wonderful uh, organizers of this at the Conservative Climate Foundation. We've got Chair Heather Reams here uh, in the room. Uh, and I, I absolutely want to thank again the Atlantic Council for hosting this, uh, this fantastic gathering and this fantastic series of conversations here this afternoon. Thank you all so much again for coming and nerding out with all of us on permitting reform. And now we'll move on to the next session.